as usual, I feel like I'm having um, thinking with uh, you, David, so you will find yourself appearing in this paper in different ways, I imagine. Um, so I want to talk about repair, uh, complicity, and accountability. Now, I've been interested lately in what sovereignty feels like, that complex of violent regulation and expectant self-determination that leans toward one or the other of these interlocking poles depending on the time or place. If sovereignty in both these iterations emerges in and through violence, that of biopolitical governmentality or that of Fanon's worlding revolution, it seems also worth asking what repair would feel like. And I've said repair here rather than reparation in order to mark a shift in orientation a shift similar to the one marked by a move from resistance to refusal. Repair, like refusal, is practice-oriented and quotidian. It is non-eventful and deeply historical and relational. Repair, like its nominal counterpart, urges us to interrogate the multiple scales of entanglement that have led us to the fierce urgency of now. But where reparation seeks justice through the naming of names, the exposure of public secrets, and the articulation of chains of causality, repair looks for something else. It demands an active listening, a mutual recognizing, and acknowledging of complicity at all levels, behavioral evidence of profound interior transformations that are ongoing. The shift from reparation to repair indexes another, from justice to affectability. This is Denise Ferreira da Silva's term, one she uses to think through the ways popular responses to anti-black state violence, like riots, like fires, demand a different kind of understanding, a knowing, in her words, than those usually pursued juridically. Knowing at the limits of justice, she writes, as an ethico-political praxis requires onto-epistemological accounts that begin and end with relationality, affectability, that do no more to anticipate what is to be announced, perhaps, a horizon of radical exteriority where knowing demands affection, intention, and attention. It is an unsettled horizon, this knowing, not a blueprint, where futures uncertainly cotch and where civil society is resituated through a recognition of the limits of justice within the terrain of liberal post-enlightenment humanism. What kind of revolution would have had to have happened for this horizon to come into being? And what kind of work can this horizon do for us, given the impossibility of true restitution? How might we think of repair affectively without evacuating the possibility of politics? And how does this affect our notion of audience? For me, these questions are raised not only by the desire to settle accounts regarding slavery, but also in relation to contemporary instances of state violence, such as that which occurred in 2010 in Kingston, Jamaica. During the week of May 24th, members of the police force and the army entered the West, uh, West Kingston community of Tivoli Gardens by force to apprehend Christopher Dallas Koch, who had been ordered for extradition to stand trial in the United States on gun and drug, drug running charges. In August 2009, when the US initially issued the request for Koch, Bruce Golding, then prime minister, resisted it on procedural grounds that the evidence against Koch was uh, obtained by wiretapping, illegal under Jamaican law. But by the third week in May, under pressure from Parliament and the US government, Golding announced to the nation on television that he had authorized the Attorney General to sign the extradition order. This led to a standoff between the security forces that had to find Koch and many of Koch's supporters who were bent on protecting him at any cost. By the end of that week in May, Koch had not yet been found and at least 75 civilians were officially recognized as having been killed. The government established a curfew for Tivoli Gardens and most movement in or out of the demarcated zone was effectively stopped, which meant that many people were unable to work, to go to school, to shop for food, or to go about the ordinary routines of their lives. This continued until June 22nd when Koch was detained and subsequently extradited. 
Despite the immediate activities of various civil society organizations, it took almost three years for the Office of the Public Defender to submit an interim report to Parliament regarding the conduct of the security forces. As anyone familiar with Jamaican state formation knows, the 2010 Tivoli incursion is merely the most recent event in a long history of struggle related to garrison communities, the homogenous voting communities that were developed in downtown Kingston after independence to ensure support for, politi for particular political representatives in exchange for contracts and other social welfare provisions. These benefits have been mediated through the relationship between a politician and a local don, but this relationship has transformed over the years as the elaboration of the transnational trades in cocaine and weapons supplanted a previous, previously smaller scale trafficking in ganja and strengthened the role of the don vis-a-vis -vis the politician. This is how Christopher Dodds Koch, among others, drew the attention of the US Department of Justice. While the commission of inquiry that was called for by the public defender's report finally got underway in December 2014, a list of the dead has still not been released and community members still feel their stories haven't been fully heard. Over the past three years, therefore, I've been working collaboratively with psychologist Diane Bell and musician Junior Wedderburn to develop a film and multimedia installation project with Tivoli Gardens community residents as well as some from other nearby communities. The project is designed to provide a platform through which uh, West Kingston residents can recount their experiences during that week in May <clears throat> and can name and publicly memorialize <clears throat> excuse me, loved ones they lost. <clears throat> It is also designed to interrogate and juxtapose the various archives, uh, the, the different forms various archives of state violence might take, <clears throat> and to encourage us to re-examine our notions of causality, complicity, accountability, and repair. So there are many striking patterns within the narratives we've been archiving with community members, and one is the fact that with few exceptions, when we ask community members what they think could and should happen to change their situation beyond the commission uh, of inquiry about which, uh, not surprisingly, most community members are skeptical, they seem unable to articulate any kind of transformative program, instead leaving it obliquely up to the next generation or making vague me mention of education or jobs programs. So this is not striking because we're looking to them for the next emancipatory political vision or because we're seeing in them the potential vanguard of resistance that will finally transform the organization of the state. It's striking because it constructs a future evacuated of what Tony Bogues has called the prophetic redemptive tradition, a tradition that has long undergirded radical black politics in Jamaica and the Americas more generally, which does kind of constantly produce the future as an ever-moving, ever-receding um, object. We could see the Tivoli incursion then as marking the end of a particular view of revolutionary political possibility throughout the region. So this is something with which David has also long been concerned, and I just want to talk a minute about how you deal with it in the Grenada um, book. So David's argument here is that temporal disjunctures live on in the aftermath of political catastrophe and that these disjunctures dislodge what had been for the revolutionary generation a taken for granted relationship between history and time. No longer is time experienced as linear and redemptive itself as many have noted uh, a product of liberal modernity where more perfect futures are brought into being through the realization of a political project uh, instead, in the wake of revolutionary failure, that generation experiences time traumatically as stalled in the present, as a cyclical loop without promise of change. For them, as David writes, the past is a wound that will not heal. The new hegemony of neoliberalism, however, has produced a post-revolutionary generation that is less enmeshed in the liberal temporalities that organized political time before them and therefore more immune to the sense of vulnerable longing that characterizes their parents' sense of time. 
This means that their histories of the present are disconnected, as David writes, quote, from the temporal structure of revolutionary desire. For Scott, the younger generation of Grenadians about whom he is writing can blast open new futures because they're able to act in the present, unfettered by the expectations of a global left and a politics of non-alignment. In a context like Tivoli Gardens, however, this seems significantly trickier. If we were to think about the 2010 state of emergency as a kind of revolution, it would be one to end politics as usual. This would mean, of course, to upend the foundations upon which and the mechanisms through which liberal democratic nationalism was built and actualized in Jamaica. Yet this revolution has neither comprehensively destroyed the foundations it set out to challenge, nor laid any groundwork for an alternative organization of political activity, political authority. Indeed, in many ways, the incursion was seen by many, including some who live in Tivoli Gardens, as a necessary response to a revolution that had already happened. The scaffolding of patron clientelism had already been significantly bent, not only by the general climate of neoliberalism, but also by Dodos himself, who more than any other Don before him, operated independently of politicians, united Dons across Jamaica and transnationally, and even in some cases across political parties, and created opportunities within private enterprise whether, rather than through government contracts for himself and others. This is decidedly not the revolution imagined by mid 20th century nationalist or post-independence leftists. Nor would it have been the, the revolution imagined by political theorists like Hannah Arendt, for whom the council systems that emerged through the 1956 Hungarian Revolution and during the, the American Revolutionary War were emblematic of true democratic participation. Or of C.L.R. James, writing as J.R. Johnson, for whom slaves, not French radical politicians, transformed Western civilization from feudalism to capitalism on the plantations of Haiti, and thus uh, his, his impression that their descendants would necessarily be the vanguard for the shift from capitalism to socialism. This revolution instead instantiates the contemporary reorganization of sovereignty and brings to light the new mechanisms through which governance occurs. It indexes what Wendy Brown has called the stealth revolution of neoliberalism the converting of every dimension of political, juridical, educational, <clears throat> and sociocultural activity, the foundations of democracy itself, into economic metrics. If sovereign state formation in the British West Indies was originally built on a developmentalist alliance between peasants, political parties, and unions, who channeled, co-opted for some observers, the energy of the region-wide worker strikes during the late 1930s into a legible anti-colonial struggle. And if this alliance was eventually destabilized in places like Jamaica by the adoption of economic development policies that ultimately maintained dependency, and by the emergence of garrison politics writ large, where the emphasis was, not, uh, was on loyalty not to party or principle, but to individual leaders, both politicians and strongmen. If all of these things, what we are now seeing is an attempt to dismantle the latter without truly exposing the transnational entanglements and geopolitical machinations that have facilitated the wealth, privileges, and protections that have made this kind of system possible over many years. This suggests that we must reorient our approach both to sovereignty and to repair. While the West Kingston Commission of Inquiry is critical to a national and diasporic discussion of how sovereign violence has been generated and the institutions through which it is and has been enacted, it will not ultimately transform the lives of those who lost loved ones or who were themselves injured within Tivoli Gardens, even if people are compensated monetarily for damage to property, as some community members hope. It will not suddenly enable Annette Irving, whose sister was killed during the state of emergency, to revel in the company of her nephews, whom she currently avoids because they remind her of her own loss. Nor will it stop Sean Bowen, a youth dragged from place to place downtown with his hands tied behind his back among hundreds of other men who, threatened and humiliated, were sure they were on their way to their own execution from beginning his morning with white rum. It will not, as community members say, bring back life, either literally or metaphorically, 
In part, this is because the commission and others like it is a juridical solution that relies on a liberal humanist conception of rights and morality that merely produces the juridical and economic subjects it presupposes without fundamentally transforming their material, social, or symbolic conditions. It's also because truth commissions and other inquiries require for their realization that we imagine ourselves to exist in a post-violence, post-conflict moment, rather than encouraging us to interrogate the forms of historical and everyday violence that co-relate to create the conditions for spectacular enactments. If a, ship for, a, a shift from reparation to repair rescues us from the hegemony of liberalism and its notions of causality and resolution, it must also foreground a sense of ethics that releases us from the hegemony of juridical resolution, itself grounded in the violence of law, particularly for those defined by law as something less than human. What's required, therefore, is a more robust sense of ethics and justice. It's this sense of ethics that suffuses Jacques Derrida's future anterior, the time that will have become, will have been in the process of becoming. For Derrida, time can't be anteriorized merely through memory, the methodological basis for many truth commissions or commissions of inquiry, because memory does not exhaust the relationships of obligation, causality, and accountability created through entanglement. Karen Barad argues something similar in this regard. Memory, she says, is not a record of a fixed past that can ever be fully or simply erased, written over, or recovered. And remembering is not a replay of a string of moments, but an enlivening and reconfiguring of past and future that is larger than any individual. Remembering and recognizing, she continues, do not take care of or satisfy in any or in any other way reduce one's responsibilities. Rather, like all intra-actions, they extend the entanglements and responsibilities of which one is a part. What violence produces, therefore, is the need for a new ethical disposition, one that seeks to probe and acknowledge the extent to which we are complicit in its reproduction and therefore obligated to its transformation. This point is aspirational, rooted in a commitment to what Avery Garden describes as follows. When you know in a way that you did not know before, then you've been notified of your involvement. You are already involved, implicated in one way or another. And this is why, if you don't banish it or kill it or reduce it to something you can already imagine, already manage, when it appears to you, the ghost will inaugurate the necessity of doing something about it. What, therefore, is this something to be done? How do we address the question of what it means to be a human capable of acting in and on a world that hides the ontological entanglements of violences that have been foundational to its formation? How do we generate the affectability that is necessary to this project of knowing and thus of repair? Shalini Puri has recently argued that there's a relationship between scale and affect within the context of revolution. In her analysis of the ways mem uh, memory of the Grenadian Revolution has been mapped onto landscapes, both literal and figurative, she notes that considerations of size have often led scholars and popular audiences to dismiss Car uh, Caribbean revolutionary claims to world historical significance. However, if we understand the Caribbean as having been central to processes of capitalist modernity, we must also consider that the size of Caribbean territories might allow for a different lens through which to view revolutions, genocidal violences, and their aftermaths. Puri suggests that it's Grenada's small size that necessitates attention to the centrality of care and to the affective ties and rifts that characterize intergenerational dynamics. She argues that paying attention to these dynamics might give us a more profound purchase on both the forging of and long-term resonance of attempts to chart different and more egalitarian futures. Here, violence is not resolved but worked through without intention, without closure, and without guarantee through the everyday. It's become rather commonplace to argue that the effects of violence should be measured not merely in terms of numbers of persons dead, of dwellings raised, but vis-a-vis -vis the structural conditions this violence sets into motion and then naturalizes. 
historical responsibility, Michelle Rothkriel writes, cannot hark back to an original sin that the collective individual supposedly committed. Rather, he continues, it needs to take into account the structures of privilege unleashed by a history of power and domination and to evaluate the current losses introduced by the reproduction of these structures. This would synthesize the position of most reparation activists today. What I'm suggesting is that in addition to this attention to the patterning, patterning of structural violence, we must also take seriously the qualitative and phenomenological dimensions of experience that influence our ontological notions of temporality, causality, and mutuality. This would require a turn toward interiority, what James and Grace Lee Boggs years ago called revolution through human evolution. For them, reflection-based practice was to inform intentional revolutionary work in the world. A revolution involved, this is their words, a revolution involved making an evolutionary, revolutionary leap toward becoming more socially responsible and more self-critical human beings, they wrote. In order to transform the world, we must transform ourselves. I want to displace the centrality of outward-oriented intentionality here, however, in order to suggest that a true revolution in the disposition of the human being, and this is Kant, can only be interior. The most revolutionary transformations arise from the interior recognitions and shifts in consciousness that radiate from one to another in unexpected and necessarily nonlinear ways. These are internal revolutions that must be lived relationally and affectively through quotidian practice whose ethical foundation requires the profound recognition not only of common humanity but also of collective complicity. By arguing for such a profound interiority, I do not mean to seemingly abandon the political realm, nor do I mean simply to invoke the cultivation of ethics through practices of the self. What I want to argue for is a kind of politics of endurance, though again, not the deadening keeping on of bare life and cruddiness that others have discussed. Instead, I want to propose that we must cultivate affectability through attentive care in order to know and therefore recognize the various dimensions of complicity we inhabit. It's only through these recognitions that we can work through the complex entanglements of accountability, and only then that we can act reparatively in concert as humans. <laughs>